Hello everybody. How are you? I hope you're holding up okay. Um, we've been through a lot in the past four or five days. Wow, it seems like a year. Um, and a lot is going on. Uh, <laughs> so it looks like we're going to be conducting class remotely. Um, and I'm going to do my absolute best to support you in moving through the material and doing everything we need to do. Um, and I hope you're all okay. Uh, this video is going to be a little long because there's a lot of information I need to push to you via this uh, format. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is work, walk you through some reminders and then we are going to take a look at some content related to the class. Um, and this should all take maybe half an hour to get through. Um, so uh, my first um, thing I'm going to do is just give you some um, reminders about what I'm calling the Corona Apocalypse um, because that's how it feels right now, I'm sure, to you, especially many of you who were um, thinking about graduating. Um, so I'm just going to put this into slideshow mode to walk you through some things and then we'll start with uh, content for uh, today's class. So first of all, um, the first thing I'd say to do before anything else is to take safety measures. That means um, following all the guidance about social distancing, washing your hands, um, not engaging in high-risk activities that could end up um, infecting you. Um, but also like self-care stuff like drink water, go outside, uh, do some push-ups, do some jumping jacks, um, you know, uh, eat some food maybe limit your consumption of alcohol. I know it's tempting to just self-medicate that way, um, but you know, not overall good for you. Um, so do those things to maintain your safety. And then my other recommendation would be try not to worry too much. Um, you have a massive team of people working to get you over the finish line in terms of the semester. So I am here for you. We are gonna work together. Um, most of the deadlines in class are going to become more flexible um, with the exception of discussion entries which we really do need to stay on time to stay on target with the spine of the course um, so if you need something just let me know um, we're gonna work together to finish out the semester strong okay um, secondarily um, in order to streamline communication and um, material sharing I have created a slack channel for our class um, so I'm going to email you all a link to that workspace. I would highly suggest you join. It's really easy to communicate back and forth with everyone in class, share ideas, vent, uh, bring up topics. If you're part of a facilitation team that hasn't facilitated yet, it's a great way to create your own thread about that project. Um, so please do click into the link I've sent you via email and uh, join the Slack channel, and then you'll be able to direct message me anytime without having to mess with GVSU email, which is super clunky. Um, also, I'm aware that we are reading two books coming up that some of you may not have ha been able to grab paper copies of. Um, they were at the bookstore earlier this semester, and I did remind you to get them when you could. Um, Gaylord Phoenix and Walking with Ghosts are our final two kind of main texts in the class. Um, I've looked around. Uh, I cannot locate an electronic source for these. Um, I could possibly have the library gen generate a PDF for us of both of these of my, for my own personal copies. Um, it would be a lot of work and kind of risky to try to do. So um, please let me know if you are not able to get these two books from Amazon or other places or don't have them please message me right away and let me know so I can start working on that because it, it's going to be a lot of work to make that happen. But I will try it if it's necessary. Um, for those of you who are not able to access a computer or maybe your family members are on the computers in the place where you are all day long doing remote work and you need access, um, I would highly recommend downloading the Blackboard app to your smartphone. Um, this will not replace Blackboard, but it will let you do some things, especially discussion posts um, should be easy to do this way. Um, checking for updates, um, even just reading PDFs, um, uh, it's useful. So I would suggest grabbing that app to just kind of free up your ability to take a look at stuff. Um, 
We are proceeding with all Blackboard processes as usual, meaning that ideally at least the discussion entries would stay on target with the reading material. I'll be putting up posts just as I have been every week. Um, the groups will be um, discussing that, that prompt every week. People will be commenting on the same timeline. It's really important that that stay in place as the main way we're working our way through the materials collectively. So I'd ask that you make an attempt to stay on target with that. Um, please do try to comment on all the Blackboard discussions. I'm asking for a little bit more content there from you. Um, try to give us a hundred words or so in response to somebody's thoughts. You could also get creative and send a video or sound file. Um, those are two ways to respond to material we haven't used very much, but they are available in the tools section of Blackboard. So um, think about how you might use those to um, provide a different way of um, replying that might feel more intimate. Um, if you're on a facilitation team and you have not yet presented, we are proceeding as usual with those. Um, I know we're a little bit behind schedule, but as the materials come together for you, we'll just post them. It'll be good for people um, to take a look at those as they become available. So please do reach out to me, email me with questions. You can use Slack to find your teammates and to work on your project. Um, when you do have something prepared, please do forward that to me and submit it on Blackboard as well, and I will make it available to the class. Um, Again, our final project, there were going to be some project options, but given the fact that we're in triage, um, I am going to just move everything over to an open book essay exam. I will try to make it as flexible and as least boring as possible, <laughs> um, but it's just a much easier way to deal with things since collaboration is going to be really difficult for any other kinds of projects. Lastly. Most of the material in this course is not explicit in nature, but I know some of you might be hanging out with your parents or with young kids, siblings, um, nieces and nephews. Uh, just a little content warning, Sins Invalid, the piece that we're watching for uh, next week, and also Gaylord Phoenix do contain discussion and representations of sexuality. So I would definitely keep them away from young children. Um, and I would definitely just be alert about people who might not be supportive of this content. Um, try to maintain some privacy when viewing them. Okay, so let's get into the content for today. Um, we are starting a new unit, uh, unit four of the semester called Bodies. Um, this is, uh, you know, we've really been kind of thinking about the context in which things happen with place. Now we're thinking about the actual material experience of embodiment, noticing that Claire's book is actually split between place and bodies, right? Um, and so we're gonna think, be thinking in this unit about the body, uh, the way that we look at and consume bodies, the way that the body determines our experience um, and how the body is um, experienced specifically in queer, trans and intersex life. Um, so I've started you off with this, this great image of this human chest. Um, uh, we might think looking at this chest that this is a hyper-masculine image. It is very muscular. It looks very male. We might associate this image with action figures or bodybuilding, um, very typically masculine activities. Um, but if we know more about the context in which this body is being presented, we would know that it actually belongs to castles. Um, Castles is um, a non-binary performance artist who uses extreme training um, as well as other kinds of body modification um, in their work to document the plasticity of their body and thus gender itself. And so it's important to think about the context in which bodies are operating um, and what kinds of statements or what kinds of um, resistances queer and trans people are engaging in when we insist on our bodies as sites of meaning and value. Um, Castles is really fascinating. You might want to check out their work just by Googling them. But I thought they're um, an interesting kind of window into uh, how we're going to be thinking about embodiment in this class, largely through thinking about how we consume images of bodies. So 
Um, in this uh, lecture today, I'll be talking a bit about the ethics of looking, and I'm going to discuss three different ways of looking at bodies that we're going to be implementing in this last portion of the course. First, um, I want to cover some general ideas, um, including how personhood, this idea that to be a, to be a person, um, which is different than being a thing, right? A person is someone we recognize with autonomy, value, uh, social meaning. Um, to be a person means that we make implicit assumptions about your body and its typicality or normalcy, right? So there are ways in which we can see, even just reading Claire, uh, people with dis disabilities, um, trans people, intersex people, are often labeled it rather than he or she, right? Or often called things or monsters or freaks. Um, and this is all because of atypical embodiment, uh, generally speaking, that, that our bodies don't conform to the implicit assumptions about how bodies should act, look, move. Um, and so this puts us on the edge of the recognizably human. Um, so the manner in which bodies are visualized in culture or aestheticized or made into art tells us how to treat them ethically. Um, there are different ways of actually aestheticizing the body um, that are related to uh, you know, um, ethical treatment, um, whether someone is treated as a subject or an object, uh, a person or a thing. Um, and we're going to look at uh, three different ways of, represent, of representing the body that align with these kinds of ethics. Of course, the legibility of gender and sex as well as race are part of this process. Um, we read bodies through gendered, sexualized, and racialized schemas. So um, our standard modes of looking in Western culture are dominated by cissexism, white supremacy, um, and patriarchy, right? Images of men are primary or is considered more powerful and more protected. The male body is treated with more privacy. Um, white bodies are considered more beautiful. Um, and of course, um, the typicality of gender and um, uh, gendered anatomy, sexual anatomy is also something that trans and intersex people deal with. So when we look at a body, we are therefore participating in a sort of reconstruction or deconstruction of things like ableism, cisgenderism, heteronormativity, and white supremacy as systems. Um, images can either reproduce those systems or can trouble and problematize them. And we're going to be looking at some examples today. Um, particularly uh, when we get to next week's content and we read um, Singer's article, um, he's talking specifically about how photography has traditionally been used to communicate these values of both beauty uh, and also the deviant body. So we'll look at some examples. So three ways of looking. The first is the medical gaze. Uh, this is going to be really important for our content moving forward. Um, what is the medical gaze? It is a gaze that strips atypical bodies of their social location, suggesting that deviant bodies are uh, kind of freakish and anomalous and not actually part of culture. Now, a gaze is just a way of looking at things, right? A uh, sort of structured way of, rep of representing things. Um, so this gaze is, is used by medical photography, it's used by doctors, it's used by science, and it's a, it tends to treat um, atypical bodies as objects that are mandated to the space of like either the prison or the clinic. So if we think about examples, right? Um, these are medical photographs of intersex people, and we can see how they are presented as just kind of nameless, faceless objects, right? The only reason that the photographs of them exist is to document their pathology or atypicality. Um, it doesn't matter that they're people, they're kind of non-people, non right? So that we would say this is a medical way of sort of medicalizing the gaze and, tr and objectifying the body just down to its conditions and looking at it as deviant and as an example of deviance, right? So this gaze insists that atypical bodies have no value apart from the display of their pathology or illness or their deviance, um, meaning that they're anomalous, not normal. So be thinking of, of where you see this kind of treatment of bodies around you maybe. So that's the medical gaze. Second way of looking is the beautiful. 
and we all know this um, type of looking, um, because classical, classical ideas of beauty are all around us, uh, emphasizing balance, unity, and integrity. So very different than the medical gaze, which is looking for imperfection, it's looking for atypicality, it's looking for illness. Um, this way of looking looks for balance, unity, integrity, and perfection, right? So a great example would be Michelangelo's David, um, which is uh, really famous for its perfection of form and consistency of proportion in the body. Um, so we could say that beauty is recognized through these measurable, measurable standards of like the golden ratio that comes to us from Greek um, art and really concerned with perfection and um, so a sort of purity of line in the body. Um, this is very different from what we just looked at, and we would say that this is a classically beautiful body, right? Um, so beauty presents itself as universally legible and valuable um, in the sense that uh, we're supposed to just simply recognize this body as a perfect body. Um, it doesn't require us to do a lot of work to uh, take a second look. We, we recognize it instantly as a sort of iconic form of desirability and beauty. Um, that's celebrated throughout Western culture. So we can see how beauty can reconstruct a lot of the systems that Western culture has used to create inequality, like ableism, whiteness, cissexism. Um, uh, when we think about, for example, how homonormativity uh, lines up with a lot of these um, more um, oppressive ways of uh, that beauty tends to work, right? Yeah, homonormativity enforces these oppressive beauty standards for, for gay men, whether they're cis or trans. So you think about some of the ways in which advertising um, represents male bodies as desirable in ways that align with these very classical modes of beauty, um, like this Abercrombie & Fitch ad. Abercrombie & Fitch is infamous for its kind of eroticization of, of gay white culture. Um, and so we see the same, almost the same exact body standards and proportions represented here. Now, it really does matter, though, who and how beauty is constructed, like by whom and how, um, because not everyone gets to be beautiful, right? So um, it's, it's a constant kind of bargaining that where it really depends on which bodies are presenting themselves as beautiful. Um, for example, in this section of Claire's book, he discusses a Playboy spread of disabled model uh, Ellen Stoll um, as kind of this place where beauty is in tension, um, right? This is an example. This is one of the centerfold, I think this is the centerfold from Playboy uh, of Ellen Stoll. And Claire really does ask, like, um, is this image a bad image, right? Because it's concealing the fact that Stoll is disabled? Or is it a good image because it is presenting a disabled person as desirable um, when people with disabilities aren't generally thought of as uh, sexually attractive in our culture, right? Um, Claire really digs into this kind of tension in the image, right? Is it only a beautiful image because it conceals the disability, right? Um, uh, do we fault Stoll for doing this? Do we do we applaud her for doing it? It's it's kind of hard to say. Um, so so beauty is not simple. It's not bad all the time. It really depends on um, how people engage with it and how it's being used. We can see also with uh, castles that image I opened with. That's a very traditionally kind of beautiful body, but it's a mass a beautiful kind of ideal masculinity that female assigned people aren't supposed to and be able to embody. And so castles is kind of um, appropriating it and that makes it different than if it was just a cisgender man performing the same masculinity. Our third way of looking is the sublime and we're going to get into this more with Singer next week. Um, the sublime um, comes from the Lat a Latin root meaning up to the threshold. It's sort of this way this a sublime experience is one that strains our ability to make sense of what we're looking at, right? It is a state of wonder or awe uh, when we experience something that exceeds our ability to make sense of it due to complexity or strangeness. And so we could think of the ways in which people with disabilities have chosen to represent themselves um, as um, 
embodying a sort of sublimity, like this image of Eli Clare. This is a portrait of Eva, uh, Eli Clare painted by uh, Riva Lair, who's a disabled painter. Um, and we see here how Clare doesn't really choose to hide his disability. We see that he, his body is twisted. Um, this is not an image that is classically beautiful. Um, it is also not an image that engages the medical gaze. It is a third way of representing something more complex, something more challenging. Um, in fact, if you look on the ground there, we see a history of gender transition where uh, it looks like some long hair has been shed, right? Um, so we see an integration of, of Claire's disability with his trans identity uh, in a way that's challenging, it looks painful. Um, it's not an, a simple image to look at. And so we could say that um, this image might be a more empowered image where change and process and contradiction are all taking place. And um, therefore, it's sublime in its ability to dislocate us from our assumptions about how bodies should look or how they should work, right? What makes a body beautiful? What makes a body useful? Riva Lehrer uh, has done a lot of paintings of people with disabilities, uh, including this self-portrait. Um, which is another way in which rather than hiding her disability or sh uh, showing us only aspects of her body that don't show evidence of the disability in the way that the Ellen Stoll photo does, this painting actually locates us directly with, the, with evidence of her disability right in the middle of the frame, right? Um, so we could ask, like, what kind of challenge uh, Lair is presenting to us? What kind, you know, here, look at, look at my, my body. Um, it's a, it's a confrontational image. It's an image that withholds most of her face from us. Um, we might ask what feelings are coming up for us looking at this, what kinds of challenges um, the image presents to us as people who carry um, uh, implicit biases about you know, beauty and ugliness. What does it mean to paint oneself this way? Or in the case of queer art, um, we could look at someone like Kathy Opie, who's very famous for taking self-portraits. Um, these two self-portraits, uh, self-portrait pervert and self-portrait nursing, really do push these two aspects of Opie's identity, um, kink and motherhood, right up against each other um, in a way that might make us kind of uncomfortable, right? Like we don't normally think of moms <laughs> uh, putting on leather hoods and piercing their flesh, um, engaging in kink community. Um, these are portraits of the same person with an integrated identity, and yet our culture forces us to separate, right? Think about that charmed circle. Um, the right-hand image is on the margins. The, uh, I'm sorry, the right-hand image is um, in the center, and the left-hand image is definitely on the margins of Rubin's charmed circle. So, um, but they're all one person. So how does uh, Opie challenge us to realize the complexity of her life rather than separating those two things? So um, given that little background on ways of looking, um, I'd like you to actually engage in an activity for this evening's um, kind of class time. I would like you to navigate over to Blackboard, go into Readings and Links, and click through to watch the Sins Invalid video. It's about 55 minutes long. A uh, little context here. Sins Invalid is a disabled and largely queer and person of color led performance troupe that's been around since 2005. And they do a lot of disability justice activism and, and education while also performing on stage. I'd like you while watching to take some notes and to watch for some things. First of all, how do you think these performers are using their bodies to demonstrate uh, the power dynamics we just talked about of looking and showing of beauty and the medical gaze of sublimity? Um, how are they challenging beauty as it's constructed normatively in our culture? And also, how are they challenging the desexualization of disabled bodies in our culture? These are all things that are really important to their work. So I'd ask you to kind of pay attention to that. And then also I'd like you to track some of your own feelings as you're watching. Um, 
this is pretty confrontational art and I'd like you to pay attention to your response because it's not meant to make you comfortable. Um, so thinking a bit about what you're feeling and, and maybe why you're feeling that way and how is that connected back to some of the things we've talked about. Um, once you've watched, please navigate over to di discussions under Blackboard and I'll put up a prompt for you to just kind of unpack your thoughts about the film a little bit. And that will be our kind of activity for the class time for today. Um, so please try to do that um, you know, over the next couple of days. Um, do remember that there is a content warning on this video. Um, I would highly recommend watching it in a private space. And stay tuned for a prompt uh, on next week's readings. I'll be putting a prompt up for the discussion entry in relation to the Singer article and the Malatino reading. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna click out of here and I'm gonna say, good luck, uh, I'm here for you. Please join the Slack channel, um, message me there, send me email, stay in touch, and let me know if you're having trouble accessing any materials. All right, I'll talk to you later.